Hi, welcome back. These la the last two sessions, we looked at two versions of arbitrage. The first was pure arbitrage. We have two exactly identical assets in terms of cash flows trading at different prices at the same time with a guarantee of convergence in the price. That's pure profit. The second we call near arbitrage, where essentially you have two similar of close to identical assets trading at different prices with perhaps no guarantee of convergence. So that's close to riskless, but it's not riskless, so we call that near arbitrage. In this session, I'd like to focus on what I call pseudo or speculative arbitrage, and I have to confess that the word arbitrage doesn't even quite fit in here. This is really more traditional investing with the arbitrage thrown in there to give the cover of this being close to risk-free. So what do we mean when we say pseudo or speculative arbitrage? There are lots of strategies out there that are low risk strategies. Low risk either because they have a lot of historical data backing them up or there's some reason to believe that, that whatever price difference there is will disappear over time. Whatever the reason, these are not riskless strategies. They might not even be close to riskless, but we're going to categorize them as pseudo or speculative arbitrage. So here's the first example. It's called paired arbitrage. What is paired arbitrage? You find two companies that historically have moved together. Let's take an example, GM and Ford. They're both automobile stocks, they have a long history, and over time they've tended to move in the same direction. So let's assume that you look at 80 years of history and you discover that Ford shares trade at roughly twice what GM shares trade for. Or Ford's PE ratio is roughly one and a half times the PE ratio of GM. So you're essentially using a long history as your starting point. Then if the actual price difference between the two companies diverges from that historical relationship, you buy the cheaper one, you sell the more expensive one, and you hope that history reasserts itself. So paired arbitrage is really not arbitrage. It's really buying two stocks which have some kind of historical relationship and betting that that historical relationship returns. So on the face of it, paired arbitrage doesn't belong here, but people have tried this. This is a strategy that's been tried by lots of big investors. And the good news is it seems to have worked. If you look at studies of paired, ar of paired, paired arbitrage, and many of these studies actually create their own pairs, by using the historical data to find the most closely matched stocks, stocks which, which move together most of the time, and then looking to see if these pairs diverge from historical price relationships, and if they do, take advantage of them. So these studies, for instance, find that the returns you make from these paired, or paired trading strategies tend to, be, tend to be good, much better than what you'd make on an expected basis. And, uh, they also look at normalized prices and they find that they, they use different ways of, of creating the, the, the mispricing, but they find with different kinds of strategies you can make excess returns. Now, if you look at the, act, the, the excess returns you make, you make a return not about 6%, six, about six so investing in the top 20 pairs, for instance, based on the historical data, earns about 6% over and above your required return. Nothing to sneeze at, but it's not going to make you rich. It's not going to make you a billionaire from being a millionaire. But that's a pretty effective return if, in fact, you can deliver it. When they constructed the pairs by industry group, the excess returns tend to be small. In other words, if they let the pairs just be driven by historical data, highest correlation between two stocks, you could end up with an automobile stock and a technology stock based on the data. So the, the, the un, unconstrained investing strategies basically took the 20 best pairs, but if you constrain them to be in the same group, you actually have lower excess returns. Interesting, because a lot of paired strategies are based upon picking companies within the same group. Okay? Controlling for transactions costs does eat away some of the returns, about a fifth of the returns, but even after controlling for transactions costs, the finding that these studies come to is a paired trading strategy makes money on paper. But there are two caveats in paired arbitrage. First is it's not riskless. It's definitely not arbitrage. It's risky because there are pairs that don't make money. That there are pairs where the difference widens before it narrows. There are periods where this it, the strategy doesn't work. So it's a risky investment strategy that seems to deliver pretty good returns. And here's the other catch. Studies that have tracked the paired trading strategy through time have discovered that while the strategies did make money in the early 90s, that by the late 90s these strategies were making a lot less money, and updated versions of these studies actually find that you make even less money. So as investors have 
climbed into the strategy, tried to use it, they seem to have driven the excess returns down towards zero. The second arbitrage I want to talk about is merger arbitrage. And as I, as I mentioned in the context of talking about acquisitions in an earlier session, it's really not arbitrage. It's merger speculation. And essentially, here's what you do. You wait for a, a takeover to be announced. And then you make a bet that that takeover price is going to get pushed up from whatever the announcement price is to the ultimate offer price. That's called the arbitrage spread. And what you're trying to bet on is what the likelihood is that that spread will come to fruition and in investing in that. So the merger succeeds, you make your money. If the merger fails, you lose whatever you invested to kind of bet. So basically what will happen if the merger fails is the price will drop all the way back off into what it was before the acquisition was announced. That's your risk. In a more sophisticated version, basically the acquiring company stock will also enter into the picture. And sometimes, you know, in, a, in arbitrage, you'd see both the acquiring and the target company stock held. And you're making a bet on the combined company's value then rather than just one of the companies. Now, if you look at the evidence for merger arbitrage, again, the evidence in one of the studies that looked at 4,750 mergers concluded that on paper, again, you can make money but 9.25% annually by buying target companies after acquisition announcements, that you lose about two-thirds of the 9.25% when you count in transactions, costs, and price impact. And that's on paper. In practice, who knows? If you actually try to put all of these strategies into play, the price impact might add on to the, the cost. But at least on paper, after controlling for transactions costs, you make some excess returns, not huge excess returns. But here's the other caveat on this particular strategy. If you fail, you fail big time. So you can wipe out two years of success with one bad acquisition failure. And that's got to be factored somewhere into your strategy that it's a very heavily skewed strategy. It makes money most of the time, but when you lose money, you lose a lot of money. So when you make money, you make a little money, but when you lose money, you lose a lot of money. Net you come out ahead. But that fact that you can lose a lot of money in one time period might, ho might hold you back when you think about investing in this strategy. So collectively, if you think about pair trading, merger arbitrage, and there are dozens of other strategies like these, you're talking about potentially low, lower risk strategies in traditional investing. How much lower will depend on the particular strategy you're looking at. But here's the key thing to remember. When you're doing pure arbitrage, you can borrow 100% of your capital because you face no risk. When you're doing near arbitrage, you can have very high debt ratios, 80%, maybe 85, 90% debt. When you're doing speculative arbitrage, you're really investing in risky portfolios. Your leverage should reflect it. And the more risk there is in your speculative arbitrage, the less debt you should take on. In fact, to illustrate the danger of carrying the leverage lessons you learned from pure and near arbitrage into speculative arbitrage, you should read the story of long-term capital management. A firm that was founded in the late 90s had a lot of high-powered talent, Nobel Prize winners, great traders, got a, a tremendous reputation doing fixed income arbitrage, which is near arbitrage then became too successful for their own good in terms of attracting fresh capital, which they could not put back into fixed income arbitrage because they ran out of opportunities, and decided to go into pair trading and speculative arbitrage. The mistake they made was not that they did not look at the numbers and calculate the odds. They actually did that very well, but that they continued to keep the leverage that they did for near arbitrage as they went into speculative arbitrage. They, in a sense, they let hubris get in the way. They assumed that because they'd done the number crunching, that they were unlikely to lose money, and because they were unlikely to lose money, they could borrow 90%. Turned out in hindsight that they messed up, that they had a big failure, and that big failure triggered, in fact, all the leverage covenants and put them out of business. So if you're going to use, do, go into speculative arbitrage, remember to keep your leverage under control. And secondly, for this to work, you cannot impact market prices too much. You're talking about small pricing differences of in the process of buying shares, you push the price up, there goes your profit. Which means speculative arbitrage is really designed for smaller funds, not bigger funds. The more money you have at play, the more difficult it becomes to play this game. So in summary, when you look at arbitrage, you, have, you, know, you, you can look at pure arbitrage, you can look at near arbitrage, you can look at speculative arbitrage. You might call them all arbitrage, but the amount of risk you face varies across the different strategies. 
as a closing part to this particular session, I'd like to talk about hedge funds. So hedge funds can fall into a bunch of different philosophies because they are unique relative to mutual funds and the, the, and the fact that they can go long and go short at the same time. They're in a sense designed for strategies like the pair trading strategy where you buy the cheaper stock and sell short the more expensive stock you can have. But hedge funds can come in different philosophies. You can have value funds, you can have growth funds. But I want to look at the collective results that hedge funds deliver because at least the from the outside, the story you hear is hedge funds are run by the smartest people out there. They must make money. We take that as a given, but do they? If you look at the evidence, it's actually surprisingly muted. It's muted in what sense the returns you see hedge funds make is not super normal. If you look across all hedge funds. In fact, this study, which went from 88 to 95, and I'll show you in a minute an updated version of the study, found that the hedge funds run during this period collectively made a 13.26% average return. And the S&P 500 return over those five years was actually higher. But before you become too down on hedge funds, that 13.26% average return also went with a much lower standard deviation for the hedge funds, 9.07% versus 16.32% for the S&P 500. I don't know whether you remember when we talked about risk measures, we talked about the Sharpe ratio, which you derive by deriving, di dividing the average return you make on a, stra on, a, on, on a particular investment strategy by the standard deviation. If you divide 13.26% by 9.07%, you get the Sharpe ratio for an average hedge fund, and that works out to about 1.4 and you divide the 16.47% by the 16.32%, you get the Sharpe ratio for the S&P 500, which is close to one. You seem to get a much be better payoff to risk for investing in the average hedge fund. So does the average hedge fund deliver excess returns? If by excess returns, you mean returns greater than the S&P 500, the answer is no. If by excess returns, you mean on a risk adjusted basis, are you getting more bang for your buck? At least on average, the answer is yes. These funds are a lot more expensive than traditional mutual funds, and many of them take, I think, an obscene amount of your money for you to play the game. But at least on average, they seem to deliver something different. And in fact, in this graph, I've kind of updated the returns to bring the data all the way up through 2009 for different classes of hedge funds. So you see both the, the, the gross return and the net return. The net return is the return you and I will see as investors. And again, the broad lessons come through. Hedge funds deliver decent returns, but they, the stories you hear about 80% returns, 100% returns reflect the outliers. They're the exception rather than the rule. The average hedge fund has a pretty good risk and return trade-off. They've done pretty well. That number is sliding over time as the number of hedge funds expands. They're becoming more like regular mutual funds. But here's the key thing to remember. Many hedge funds don't make it. In fact, if you just compute average returns across hedge funds and you factor in the survival risk, the fact that hedge funds don't make it, you see your average returns drop off fairly significantly. But many of the funds that start out don't make it, which means the hedge fund business is a lot more competitive and a lot less lucrative than it looks like from the outside. So in closing, arbitrage is nice if you can find it but you're unlikely to find pure arbitrage. We have two exactly identical assets, exact same cash flows trading at different prices and guaranteed price convergence. Near arbitrage might show up, but more likely to show up in derivative markets, no options, futures. And if you do find it again, you have to be in the right place in the right time, lock it in and make your money, but it cannot be the basis for long-term money making as an investment philosophy. And finally, you can have pseudo arbitrage where you take low risk or even medium risk strategies and you try to exploit them. Many of these strategies require that you go long short at the same time, which is part of the reason I looked at hedge funds as my in that context. And collectively if you look at hedge funds, you can see that there are people out there making money off pseudo of these 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 pseudo arbitrage opportunities, but you can also see the risks still start to show up. So I hope you find arbitrage opportunities out there. I hope you keep looking. But I think if you find one, you should take advantage of it. But to spend the rest of your life looking for pure arbitrage will waste your time and your resources. Thank you very much for listening.